It's week 33 of 2018, and today Don and I are going to be talking with Evan of the Linux Professional Institute. We've also got some stories about multi-factor authentication and how it doesn't always work. That's all coming up on the Technado, starting right now. Hello and welcome to Technado. I'm your host, Peter Van Rysdam, and I'm joined here as always. Well, I don't say as always because we've kind of had a few different weeks of different things, but we, we got Don here now. Don, how are you doing? I am doing well. And, you know, it, it is the, the first podcast in a little while that we've both been in the office at the same time, which is good because things have been exciting. We've had a lot of interviews. We've had the opportunity to go out and film it at B-Sides Las Vegas. So it is nice to get back in the office, but... Our great interview chain hasn't stopped, right? We have a good interview lined up today, don't we? Yeah, we will be uh, going virtually out of the office here all the way, um, well, I wouldn't say overseas, but internationally. To Canada. Uh, to Toronto, Canada. <laughs> uh, and we're going to be talking with Evan. Uh, Evan Leibowitz, uh is the director uh, of community development at LPI. And LPI, you, you've got a little bit of a history with them. Sure, yeah, the, the Linux Professional Institute. They have uh, a number of certifications that are available. The LPIC one is probably their most popular one. Uh, that's Linux Professional Institute certification level one. Uh, most people are familiar with it because it's linked to the CompTIA Linux Plus certification, that if you take and pass the Linux Plus exams, you can then go over to the lpi.org website and register your CompTIA scores, and you'll be awarded the LPIC one as well. So you can kind of get both certifications at the same time. Uh, it's not an automatic process, but you, you do get it. So uh, pretty cool to be able to do that. But if you want to go more advanced, this is where, like, how I got involved with LPI. Uh, the CompTIA Linux Plus only gets you so far. If you want to go more advanced, that's where the LPIC 2 and LPIC 3 certifications come in. Uh, I'm LPIC 2 certified. I'm actually working on my LPIC 3 right now, uh, which is, covers a huge amount of information. It's just a big volume of data. So uh, definitely exciting certifications to get uh, and really useful. But they are branching out into other areas and offering more certifications. There have been various rumors about and the whole point of this coming interview with Evan is that we want to try and get an idea of where the LPI is going over the next year and some of the new stuff that is coming out on the horizon. Yeah, and they're celebrating a big anniversary here as well. So let's go ahead and get right to that. We're going to bring Evan in here right after this here on Technado. All right, welcome back. And as promised, we are joined now by Evan from LPI. Evan, are you able to hear us? Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, uh, yeah, thank you for coming. And now, if we could just kind of start for those that maybe aren't familiar with LPI, if you can give us a little bit of background, um, tell us about the organization um, and, and how you got involved. Sure. Uh, LPI is the Linux Professional Institute. We started in 1999 by a bunch of uh, people within the open source grassroots that got together and saw that open source was growing and saw that one of the gaps in open source as it was growing and Linux was how were people going to get jobs and careers in the field of Linux and open source. We saw it was growing. We saw that people wanted to hire people working in Linux and open source, uh, but they were looking for a skill standard for people that we're going to be you know, running the systems and admitting the, the, the servers and so on. And so uh, through a community that was a combination of open source advocates and professional educators, uh, we got together and created LPI as an international nonprofit uh, headquartered in Toronto, in the Toronto, Canada area, but uh, with a presence in more than 180 countries uh, that has grown since 1999. Uh, coming into our 20th anniversary. And we have uh, we have people essentially all over the world that are training, taking the certifications and getting jobs in open source because of the LPI program. Now, where exactly um, do you guys fit in with that process? Are you providing the training and offering the certification exams? And, and does it go beyond that as well with, with placement? So uh, where, where exactly does it, do you guys fit in that cycle? Uh, well, 
we started philosophically as a group that did not get into training explicitly. So we created the skills tests. We defined what it meant to be, um, you know, level one, level two, sys administrator. Uh, we uh, went through a very high quality process to create a set of, set of exams that could be delivered worldwide. And we worked with uh, the training community, both in the private sector and the public sector, to create courses. Uh, that would be targeted at those skill standards. Uh, we saw at the time that most IST certifications existed to either sell a certain training regimen or to help back up sell a particular kind of software. So if you were trained on a particular software tool, when you came out of that certification, all you knew was that tool. So uh, we were very explicitly from the beginning uh, neutral regarding uh, what kind of Linux, what kind of open source, and also what kind of training. So as far as we were concerned, it didn't matter if you uh, took a, a, an extended uh, training course, whether you uh, bought a book or watched videos, or uh, just hunkered down with the Linux computer for uh, you know a couple of weeks and taught yourself. All that mattered to us is that you knew the stuff, our certifications were meant to separate people that knew their stuff from people that didn't. Uh, we still work worldwide with a network of uh, training centers and, and, and training partners and publishing partners, uh, but we strive not to get into that. We explicitly don't want to compete with uh, the publishing industry and the training industry. And uh, in terms of the uh, career growth afterwards, uh, we haven't done very deeply in that in, in the part of that helps people get jobs once they are certified. Uh, as we get into our 20th anniversary and beyond, that's going to be one of our bigger initiatives. Now, I know for me as a, as a system admin type, I, I really appreciate the work the LPI has done because a lot of the organizations that are out there that are built around Linux really focus on the development side of things. So, uh, you know, if I go to a Linux Foundation conference, it's almost all developer presentations. And for me, I, I always struggled because I, I wasn't a developer. I was somebody who actually implemented Linux you know, for, for companies. You know, I, I was the one responsible for just keeping it running and, and getting it out there. And with today's world, we've seen this drive towards Linux, especially in the server space, uh, as far as cloud deployments and, and other areas like that, where it's kind of become an essential tool for sysadmin. So your certifications that were launched, um, there's the, the LPIC, one, two, and three, you know, I know there's a couple of variations of three uh, that are available. They were all targeted towards that system admin side. So when you guys started, when you formed back know, almost 20 years ago, what what made you decide to target that as opposed to going the developer side or, or, or the other sides of Linux? But what made you want to to jump in there and create certifications around administration? Well, first off, that's where we saw an awful lot of the jobs happening and a lot of the careers happening in the world of open source uh, was that, you know, as we saw Linux growing into the cloud and into mobile space, we saw that there was going to be an increasing need for people to know how to administer systems, how to secure them, how to do the networking and so on. So as you said, the level three goes into various levels of specialization so that some people may go in a certain direction uh, more towards security or more towards networking and so on. Uh, but we saw, at least for the first few levels, that uh, yes, there were uh, the, some of the greatest needs from uh, IT uh, deployment organizations were they were needing system, administrator, system administrators. Now, since then, uh, we've come up with a couple of other certifications, uh, one of which is in DevOps, which isn't, for instance, a specific development language per se, but it's a, a set of tools and processes for doing uh, software development. So we've gotten into it to a small extent that way, but we're also going in, in fact, the other direction in which we're creating a new program called the Business of Open Source Software or BOSS certification next year, which is going to be uh, not even for sysadmins, but also for IT managers. So it's going to be a certification and training program that's going to be involved. Uh, what are the licensing issues about open source? What are the deployment issues? Uh, what are the redistribution models? Uh, we've encountered an awful lot of uh, myths, truths, half truths, and and uh, and rumors surrounding uh, you know what is really uh, the truth about using open source licenses. So we found that there's a great demand uh, for even having a program that says um, you know when you come out of this program, uh, you understand, for instance, the difference between an open source license 
and the public domain. You understand what's involved with uh, redistributing open source or, you know, the myth of does having one particular piece of open source in your organization, meaning, you know, everything else is infected. There's all sorts of things like that uh, that are going to be covered off by the new program. So, in fact, not only are we targeting system administrators like we've been doing since uh, when we started, uh, but the, uh, the new business of open source program is also going to help us uh, create a program for IT management and for policymakers so that they'll be aware of the realities of open source. And when they make the decision to either use or not use open source, they'll use it based on informed decision making. Now, with the the LPIC certifications, you got multiple tiers, you know. So you start with the the, the basic level, the the kind of general sysadmin, and then you get more specialized as you go. Your your new offerings as you move into DevOps and and kind of a, the the business side. Do you see those expanding out into multiple tiers also, or are you guys kind of testing the water? At this point, I don't see any need uh, or requirements to go beyond what we've done for the DevOps program. And similarly for the business of open source, I mean, um, you know, to know what the GPL is, to know what the difference is between the various levels of open source licensing, uh, I'm not sure whether or not that actually needs multiple levels. Uh, we're not going to create a multiple tiered system just for the sake of having it if we think um, that one program will cover it all. And so as we speak right now, there are uh, groups of subject matter experts that are going through in the case of the business of open source program, we're going to define what it means to uh, be an expert in this and uh, what kind of issues are going to need to be uh, trained and taught and uh, tested through this program. Uh, I don't anticipate this is going to require multiple tiers, um, but if it does, that's something that's going to be determined by the experts in the field. Uh, we've got a very rigorous quality process uh, in making the programs and the certifications. And so uh, I'll trust that process to tell us um, whether or not we need multiple tiers. My instinct right now tells me not. Um, one other thing that we've been doing, uh, if you would, is uh, at a level below the LPIC uh, is something that we have called Linux Essentials. And so for people that just want to get their feet wet and even make a decision whether or not to get into open source as a potential career, um, then they would go towards Linux Essentials. So that's not even, you know, how do you do sysadmin? It's knowing the basics of Linux and just, you know, the fundamentals of it. We're looking to expand the Essentials program uh, and uh, into its own sort of track. So uh, possibility of doing things like uh, Internet of Things, Essentials, and so on. Uh, for people to take a very, very basic program and understand whether or not this is something they even want to explore further at a career path. You know, I haven't had a chance to look at any of the Essentials content yet, but uh, uh, we're going to be out at the Lisa conference in October, and I know that LPI is going to be there as well. Uh, I think uh, it showed that you could take the Essentials exam for, I believe it was only $75 or something, uh, you know, an inexpensive way to get in there and get that first cert and kind of start your career on Linux. Um, speaking of different certifications, back in December, uh, there were a few announcements that went around about uh, LPI teaming up with uh, uh, one of the BSD organizations to create a BSD set of certifications. Uh, that was about eight months ago. So is there any news on that front, or is that still just a work in progress? No, as a matter of fact, it's very real. Essentially, what's happened is we've collaborated with uh, the BSD certification group, and in fact, LPI is the global distribution now for the BSD certification program. So through channels uh, throughout the world, uh, we're delivering the BSD certification exam. Uh, we're working with them on a, a enhancements and improvements. So essentially what's happening is that collaboration is real. It's live right now. So if somebody wants to take the BSD certification program, uh, they would actually do that through uh, an LPI testing center. Oh, exciting. I, uh, I had no idea the exams had gone live. I need to I need to brush up <laughs> my BSD and go take one. Yeah, and I'm I'm definitely the one that needs to start with the uh, the essentials. But but <laughs> I had a question for for someone that maybe uh, has worked in open source a little bit before. It, it's um, it's it's part of what they do at work, um, but they don't have any certifications. What are the, what would you tell them are the the benefits um, to going ahead and 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 taking uh, making that move to actually become certified? What um, what what are the the benefits that they can uh, and see out of that? 
Well, the certification, I mean, it exists to provide a, a skill standard that employers trust, that HRs trust. Uh, LBI has been trusted around the world. Our certification uh, has been delivered to hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. Uh, there's at least one person with an LPI certification in more than 180 countries. So we're being very well trusted, uh, both by people who are taking the exams and by people who are hiring those that know their stuff. Um, part of this has been because we've been uh, neutral in, in, in what we test. And, and for instance, um, we're not specific to one particular version of Linux. So somebody who goes through our program is capable of doing admin for any Linux system, regardless of who makes it. So rather than somebody going through a program where they only know one version of Linux and that's the only set of tools they know and they couldn't move to another one easily, uh, we've been fastidiously neutral about uh, making exam programs that would work across versions of Linux. And now thanks to the BSD program, we're not even, uh, you know, we're neutral when it comes to operating systems. Somebody can come through our program and take admin uh, programs on Linux or they can do it on BSD. Uh, so our neutrality has been a very, very important part of the organization from the very beginning. So for somebody who's just getting into this and is looking to turn to open sources career uh, as a career path, looking at what's happening in the cloud, looking at what's happening in mobile, and seeing that all of that now is being based on open source. Now, uh, LPI provides a path that is is both neutral and very well trusted. Now, I've got to ask about that neutrality. Uh, how how has that changed over the, the 20 years that you've been doing this? Because I know we've done some some episodes where we've looked at all the different branches and, and how how things continue to evolve, and there, there's new distros seemingly coming out all the time. Um, I, I got to imagine that was a little easier 20 years ago um, than, it, than it is now. How, how have you managed to, um, to stay neutral? Uh, actually, it's not really a whole lot easier or a whole lot harder than it was 20 years ago. Uh, the ecosystem, of, if you would, of Linux systems uh, has always spawned uh, a combination of, of all sorts of different versions of Linux. Uh, back when I was the uh, Linux columnist for ZDNet, I did a column called Why Linux is Like Pizza. <laughs> and using the, the analogy of saying, well, you have your, mul your multinational chains where you can get the same version of that pizza anywhere in the world. Uh, and you also have your local pizza store that, you know, they're neighbors and they make everything unique to your neighborhood and they're very well loved. Uh, there's room in the marketplace for all of those variations. Uh, you have a recipe for pizza that's very well known, and yet people all over the world and all over your neighborhood are making variations on that to suit the tastes of either somebody that wants consistency worldwide or they want something unique to them. Uh, that works in pizza, that also works in Linux. Uh, the nature of open source allows you to take what's in a Linux system, say, I like most of this, I like this, uh, these bits, and I'm going to replace them with something else, and voila, you've got your own new version of Linux. Uh, the players, uh, for the most part, uh, have changed significantly. I uh, have very popular versions of Linux, such as Linux Mint, uh, that are around now that weren't around 20 years ago. And you have versions of Linux like Debian and Red Hat that were around 20 years ago that are still with us today and used globally. So that diversity has always been a strength of open source. Uh, and variations have come and they've gone, uh, but um, the diversity has really been a strength. And staying neutral throughout, I think, has been a real strength of our program. Have you seen any uh, any challenges that have come about by you know one distro becoming more mainstream than another? I, I know for the longest time, uh, Red Hat kind of held the reins on that as far as corporate deployments. They were the, the the one with the most reliable commercial support. But now you have Canonical in there, and and they do a phenomenal job. And then you have other providers that are, are similar. Uh, and things are starting to deviate a bit. We're starting to see where implementations are, are getting a little strange depending on which platform you choose. For you, kind of staying neutral, uh, you know, trying to create an exam, right? Uh, I guess if we use like, a specific example, if I'm trying to create an exam that is neutral, but I know that uh, Ubuntu is using one set of update tools and Red Hat is using a different set of update tools, how how much of a challenge is that to try and stay fair and, and still make sure that you're validating people have the Linux knowledge they say they have? Well, 
although, for instance, say Red Hat and Ubuntu may have some tools, you don't replace the core ones that are in every version of Linux. They may have some specialized ones that are, you know, that they've invented something new or some new UI or whatever. But there are going to be some tools throughout there that are going to be common to every version of Linux, and they don't take those things out. They may add stuff to them for their own uh, for their own systems. Uh, but even when LPI first came out, uh, the way that you did an update on a Red Hat system was different from the way you did an update on a Debian system. Uh, we were able to accommodate that within the exam and the program. Uh, in the very first days of LPI, in fact, we had uh, we had uh, a different uh, exam if you used Red Hat and a different exam if you used Debian because those were the two major variants. Uh, since then, we found a way to accommodate within the exam uh, to test on both, and if you were good, strong at one and not the other, you necessarily got penalized. So there's been ways within the development of the exam program to be able to test for some of these uh, differentiations uh, without penalizing somebody. And so this has been our way of being able to maintain the neutrality uh, while at the same time being reasonably comprehensive. Uh, are we going to be able to test for every particular tool that you know this distribution has created that nobody else has? Uh, not necessarily. But the idea is when somebody comes out of our program, they're capable of doing admin on any Linux system. Are they going to be able to be trained on things that are very specific to that distribution or even to that organization? Not necessarily, but they will be able to sit down and use the tools that are common on every version of Linux and be able to sit down and do sysadmin right away. Excellent. Well, I know you, you talked a bit about the the future and how there's more essential exams that are coming out. Uh, as far as the main tracks, though, the LPIC 1, 2, and 3 that people are familiar with, are there any significant changes on the horizon for us on those? Version of the LPIC level 1 that has just been going through beta process now. Uh, we have very active ongoing development on all three levels. Uh, the version of the exam that's being delivered now is significantly uh, updated from the one when we first came out. So, like I said, it's on its fifth revision. Uh, we go through routine checks of all three levels to make sure that the uh, technology that's in use that we're testing for is applicable to the versions of Linux that are currently shipping. Uh, and so, again, that's been part of an ongoing quality process where feedback from our test takers as well as feedback from the subject matter experts goes through uh, an evolution cycle for all of the exams. So in addition to uh, coming out with new programs, uh, we're continuously evolving the ones that we have out already. And what was the timeline that you said for the, the BOSS exam? Is that is that 2019, or, or when can we expect to start seeing that? Uh, I expect that we're going to have some versions of that out uh the schedule I'm aware of right now says early 2019. Fantastic. All right. Well, anything else that uh, maybe we didn't ask that you want to let people know about uh, about the organization? Well, I just want to call attention to the fact we're celebrating our 20th anniversary next year. Uh, we're going to be doing a number of promotions and contests. Uh, as well, uh, as part of our 20th anniversary, uh, we're going to be going through a significant change in the way the organization is structured in the sense that we are going to be taking membership. People will be able to join LPI. Uh, people who have LPI certifications will be invited to join us as members, uh, much like a professional organization for engineers or doctors or accountants. Uh, the idea being is that it's the uh, practitioners themselves direction of the organization that is doing the certification and, and verification. So it's our goal to uh, evolve from an organization that uh, has been known as a purely a certification body to one that is member-driven and that is looking out for the long-term professionalism of uh, the people that work in open source. Uh, we're going to be getting into things like uh, professional ethics, uh, soft skills, and things like that as we go forward. And so there's some very exciting things happening in LPI that go beyond uh, just the certification exams that we're doing, but also trying to evolve OPI into an organization that's more of a professional body that's looking out for uh, the open source professionals, 
enhancing their careers and encouraging their professional development. Yeah, that's definitely fantastic. Not not just uh, you know before the certification, but after um, that, uh, that that people can get some benefit out of uh, you know being part of, of that community. Then and so if I want to find out more about LPI, I I assume there's a website. <laughs> LPI.org. LPI.org. That's easy enough. Done it's, anything it's else? It's good in all. In, it's good in all the seven languages we operate in. Okay. Yeah, I saw some things about. Brazil and and uh, I think it was Central Europe. So yeah, a lot of different events uh, coming up and and a lot of different uh, different versions. You guys have to keep up there. Well, no, I, I can't stress enough how how exciting it is to be part of an organization that literally has a presence in just about every country. Uh, the number of countries that don't have an LPI presence is easier to count than those that do. Uh, it's been fantastic. And, and working with these open source communities around the world has really made it possible for us to do something that is, um, that is, that is universal, that is, that is applicable, that somebody who gets a certification uh, anywhere in the world can come into an employer anywhere in the world with recognizable uh, credential based on a skill set that is in demand everywhere. Sounds good. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I uh, I want to just throw a word out to our viewers. If you haven't, if you're not familiar with the LPI, hopefully you are now. Definitely jump by LPI.org. Uh, their certifications, I can certainly vouch for them myself. I have a uh, LPIC one and LPIC two. Um, if you are studying for the CompTIA Linux Plus, you know that once you pass that exam, you get the LPIC-1 certification simultaneously. They're, they're kind of tied together. Uh, LPIC-2, though, goes more advanced. I highly recommend that because, you know, the, the LPIC-1 is is uh, a good subset of knowledge for most people, but LPIC-2 really is a higher level. Uh, LPIC-3 starts to specialize, get into more areas like there's a, a security-focused one, a virtualization-focused one, and an enterprise like hybrid environment model. Uh, those are significantly harder. So if you really want to show off your expertise, definitely certifications to check out and be sure to look for LPI at assorted conferences and events all across the globe. So uh, Evan, I want to thank you for spending time with us on behalf of the TechNATO podcast, as well as all of our viewers out there. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you so much, Evan, for joining us. And thank you all of you for watching. We've got a little bit more of the Technado coming up right after this. Welcome back to Technado. It was a great interview. And uh, like you, you mentioned, one, one of the things you mentioned there, they're going to be at the same conference that we're going to be at, uh, LISA, which is a, a sysadmin conference, I believe. Right? Yeah, uh, LISA, it's a big conference put on by Usenix and the, the Usenix groups. Uh, it is in Nashville, Tennessee this year at the end of October. I think it's October 28th through the 31st. Uh, IT Pro TV is going to be there. I believe we're sending Ronnie Wong and a couple of other people. Uh, and LPI is going to be there in, independently, not, you know, it's not like a team effort. Uh, but I know LPI is going to be offering exams right there at the conference at a discounted rate. So if you want to get certified, definitely a chance to jump in and check that out. And if you want to hang with the IT Pro TV crowd, definitely a chance to, to get to meet somebody in person that you'd normally just see on video. Yeah, we're uh, we're going to be doing a meetup at one of the local bars, actually an arcade bar, which looks pretty cool. Oh, so, um, so Ronnie will be there to you know take pictures with, record your voicemail greetings, um, whatever you want Ronnie to do for <laughs> you. Um, so if you're uh, if you live in the Nashville area, uh, we'll we'll definitely uh, do an email invite to to the IT Part TV members in that area, um, or if you're uh, going to be there for. Uh, for the conference, uh, we'll we'll definitely uh, put out some more information closer to that, uh, so you can RS RSVP for that because um, that's gonna be pretty cool. Maybe we'll we'll make Ronnie take one of those exams, just no prep, uh, throw him in, and see see how he does. You know, he, uh, he is such a good sport. He would certainly do the Linux Essentials exam yeah. uh, just because he he has a, a bit of exposure to Linux and. Uh, I'm sure he'd love to try it. That'd be fun. That might be a good, uh, like a test case. <laughs> yeah, a good Dan gag. Ronnie Pass. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of Linux, I'm assuming that this new uh, Apple 
an enormous data center is running a lot of, of Linux machines. Would I, would I be correct? Uh, you know, so uh, one of the first news articles we're going to talk about this week came out of Arizona. Uh, mm -hmm. AZ Central, a web magazine or, or whatever, uh, actually had a really cool article because you don't get to see stuff like this very much. Uh, data centers like the Google Compute data centers or Amazon with all of their uh, availability zones, they, they don't like to show pictures of their data centers. Well, Apple actually let some photos out uh, of their data center. Now, the data center in question is, uh, it's in Arizona, and it's kind of funny because it, I thought it was really cool to be able to see inside the data center. But if you remember the backstory, this used to be a GT Advance factory, which was the company that Apple had teamed up with to create the Sapphire screens for their phones. And then at the last minute, they canceled the deal and bankrupted the company and then bought all their assets in bankruptcy. And so this factory is one of their bankruptcy repos. So, uh, But anyhow, they've turned it into a phenomenal data center. Uh, but ignoring all of that, if you're ever bored and you have a moment, jump over to AZ Central and take a look at the, the, the photos they have on there. Uh, it's just so cool to see this stuff. We don't think of Apple as a data center company because it's, it's not like they have AWS or Microsoft Azure, but they do have iCloud, and iCloud requires a lot of infrastructure. And so they have rack upon rack upon rack of systems in place to be able to support that. Tons and tons of storage because of the iCloud storage they've got and, and just hundreds, thousands of servers that are in place. Now, Apple doesn't use this data center exclusively. They actually leverage a lot of data that is stored in Microsoft Azure and even Amazon AWS. They've actually spread their resources across multiple providers, but more and more they're starting to rely on their own systems and they have more than one data center. Uh, this is just one of them that happens to be out there. So uh, again, like I said, if you're ever bored, jump over and check it out because it's a neat chance to be able to see if you're if you're one of those people that works in a small or medium business, maybe you've never been into an enterprise data center before. So seeing things like the redundant diesel generators and the commercial grade air chillers. Yeah, go and, to the next one there. I think it is. Or, uh, might and be and the safety more. vests. That the guy. Safety yeah. vests are amazing. <laughs> no, there's uh, yeah, that one with showing the water cooling system, as it said, which, um, you know, I, I was thinking that Arizona is a cool place for um, – for a data center because you don't have the hurricanes you don't have um you know really as much with the earthquakes or things like that but boy do you have heat and and you're generating a lot more heat um uh, with these servers so um yeah. that that's one way to help keep things cool you know so there's always pros and cons right so uh, on a positive side out in arizona you don't have to worry about humidity in the air as much mm -hmm. and so equipment will last longer on a negative side, static electricity, ESD, oh. uh, is a bigger problem. So data centers that are built out there have to have exceptional grounding, uh, and you'll see people, uh, we might make fun of those ESD wristbands and things, but when you get out there, it's it's not really an option anymore. It's stuff you have to have. But well, probably air filtration as well. You know, think about dust storms and things like that that, that can happen out in the desert. So, uh, yeah, each, each one's going to have its own pros and cons, and that's why it's great to have things uh, in multiple data centers uh, <laughs> with, with the cloud. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, anyhow, it is a neat view, and, and every now and then we get to kind of peek behind the scenes and see those data centers. So uh, check it out on azcentral.com. All right. Well, our next article um, is is one of those you know flashy Bitcoin articles, but we're, we don't want to actually talk about it because of Bitcoin. Um, but we'll go ahead and uh, give you the headline here on Tom's Hardware. A Bitcoin investor robbed of cryptocurrency blames AT&T. Well, I like to blame AT and T for everything that goes wrong in my <laughs> life, um, so that's nothing new. But uh, but Don, do you think that he has any um, sure validity in his argument? So I, I almost didn't read this article because it had Bitcoin, and I, I've been so <laughs> tempted to put a filter on my newsreader like Bitcoin block it. But uh, but this one actually does have a a really good lesson in here, which is the 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 way that this attack was perpetrated, right? So the basic story is that there's this guy, uh, Michael Turpin, who has been involved in Bitcoin for a long time. He's he's done a, a number of different projects in that in space. And he had over $24 million in Bitcoin stolen from his accounts uh, several months ago. And what happened was he had dual factor authentication turned on for his account. His username and password got compromised and the attackers were able to compromise the dual factor authentication. Now, the, uh, the, the second factor in this case was a text-based PIN number, right? So we, we've probably seen that, like Twitter does that, where you log into Twitter, you username and password, and then it sends a text message to your phone with a code, 
and you've got to punch in that code to get logged in and then you're able to access the system, right? Well, if somebody steals your phone, then they would effectively have your PIN number, right? Uh, if they steal your phone. But what happened here was what's called a SIM swap fraud, where the attackers had a phone, just a completely different phone with a completely different SIM number or SIM card, and called up AT&T and was able to trick the people, uh, you know, the support personnel at at and side to transfer cell service from the existing SIM card over to this stolen SIM card. So then when they did a password reset or they tried to log in, when that text was sent, that had the code number to be able to, to do the, the second factor of authentication, it went to the attacker's phone instead of the actual user's phone. And so that's the way they were able to get in and the way they were able to get around dual factor. Last year, actually I think it was two years ago, NIST came out and said SIM-based or SMS-based multi-factor authentication is not good enough, right? And a lot of people, even me included, I, I said, ah, you know, what are the odds of somebody doing a phone attack? It's got to be really targeted at that point, and it's just, it's not realistic. But this is a great example that shows it does work. You People are able to take over a phone, and they don't have to hack the system. They just need to trick the support person yeah, on the other end of the phone. social engineering, essentially, right? Uh, this was a social engineering attack at its, at its, uh, at its kind of base. That's yeah. really all it was. Uh, and they got $24 million in, in fake money, uh, which I assume they can turn into at least 20 bucks in real money. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what Bitcoin's trading at right now, but uh, it, it may be that low. But uh, yeah, that is, that is pretty impressive um, on, on the hacker's part to be able to pull that, that whole thing off. But, but you're right, this does look like a, a targeted attack um, that, that they knew that this, this money existed um, uh, and were able to not only, like you said, get the username and password uh, for this, this user, but also uh, knew to target then his, his second form of authentication. And hopefully for this guy's sake, when AT&T says that all call calls are recorded uh, for customer service purposes, uh, that they actually did record it, and he's able to uh, use that in court. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to matter, right? I don't know that the courts recognize Bitcoin as a real thing yet. Uh, so. Well, he's asking for $24 million in real money back, as well as $200 million in punitive damages. So yeah. uh, I, we'll see where this one goes. I will be surprised. Uh, you know, AT&T has a good argument in saying when they offer you text messaging service, it's so you can send messages, not so you can have the second level of security for your other accounts. Like, that's not a commitment they make. I seriously doubt the lawsuit has any traction. But it is more of a morality tale or lesson or whatever for the rest of us that if you have really sensitive systems, you should be looking into doing things like YubiKey or, or some kind of uh, U2F, a FIDO key, to be able to authenticate. Because somebody can't call me and trick me into giving them my YubiKey. I can't, can't do it. But they can trick the phone company into rerouting my my phone calls or something of that nature. So so definitely something to be aware of. And sadly, not the only multi-factor authentication bypass in the news this week, right? We had a, another article that was on the same lines, didn't we, Peter? Yep, we did. Over at uh, ThreatPost.com, we've got another one here. The Microsoft flaw allows full multi-factor authentication bypass. And I, I can only assume that this one is talking about people stealing retinas um, from other people's... Uh, Skulls, yeah, like in Demolition Man, yeah, and <laughs> and uh, Minority Report, and just a whole slew of of things. We could make a whole security training program just based out of movie clips. Yeah, I mean, we'd get shut down by the MPAA, but sure. still, it'd be fun. Uh, yeah, this one, this one's pretty bad, actually. Um, basically, what happened is security researchers found a way to exploit Microsoft's Active Directory Federation services to allow them to bypass multi-factor authentication in a really, really bad way. Basically, what happens is when you have multi-factor authentication, you traditionally will log in with a username and a password, right? And then after that, you're challenged for multi-factor authentication and you have to provide it. Well, what the researchers found was that in some instances, Active Directory Federated Services, it would validate your username and password. And then when it got to multi-factor, it, it would validate your multi-factor credentials but not against your account. It would actually validate them just against anybody. So any one person's multi-factor authentication key could work with any other user. There might be 100,000 users in that AD, and you had like a regular user account, just regular, simple, you know, maybe you're a student in a university. 
and you log in as an IT guy, if you're able to steal their username and password, you could use the multi-factor authentication results for your own key against that IT user's account, and it would let you in. So effectively, it turned everyone's multi-factor authenticator into an authenticator for everybody else, which is is pretty bad. It still did require it. I mean, it basically had to be an insider attack to take advantage of it. Um, but if you were to say, I mentioned YubiKey a minute ago, right? If you were walking around campus and you just happened to find somebody's YubiKey, you could then use that on anybody's account to get in. It was really bad. Uh, Microsoft has already pushed an update. The update was released, I believe, two weeks ago, uh, and it's just being disclosed now. So if you're using multi-factor authentication inside of Active Directory Federated Services, which you should be, you absolutely need to do an update of your domain controllers. Make sure your DCs get updated, or at least the DCs that are participating in Federation services, so that that is patched and that won't happen. They just weren't doing a, a proper backend check to make sure the credentials being run against the actual account authenticating, uh, and that is fixed now, all taken care of by a Windows update. So definitely get out there and do that. Uh, thank you for the team at ThreatPost for doing a great write-up on that. Yeah, and, the, and the, I think the best line in here is it's similar to taking a room key for a building and turning that key into a skeleton, skeleton key that works on every door in the building because that's essentially what happened. So you still have a key. You have to have a key to get in, but you can have anybody's key, it sounds like. so. Uh, all right, well, let's move over to, well, the aptly named Naked Security uh, by, by Sophos here at nakedsecurity.sophos.com uh, where we've got an article that will test my maturity um, here. So beware. Porn scam uses your phone number to blackmail you. So, Don, what have I got to worry about here? All right. So this is um, effectively a phishing attack that has been going around for – I the, the first instance I saw of it was about a month ago. One of the people here in the office had gotten this. Uh, since then, a number of people here in the office uh, – uh, one of our – one of our edutainers who will remain unnamed, their <laughs> sister got it and came to them and said, is this real? Uh, this attack has been going out via email. It's also been going out via physical mail and via some other techniques. So this is, is kind of all across the board of how you get it. But the way the message works is all pretty much the same. It's an email or, or other data that will have some kind of information about you. It will say, I do know, and then your actual name or your email address or your, your phone number or your password from some previous account. And then it'll go on to say you had visited an adult website, and when you did, they installed a remote administration toolkit or rootkit or something, uh, and then they were able to monitor your webcam, and they now have compromising footage of you, and they're going to release it unless you send them some big bucks, right? Uh, this is preying on people's insecurities, right? People, people don't know whether their computer has been compromised or not. And they get an email like this with even the most basic of information about them and assume that it must be real. But in reality, there is no actual technical attack behind this. Your system is not compromised. They're just using databases that are readily available on the internet. Uh, you know, if you go to sites like Have I Been Pwned, you can search for your email address and see if it's ever been in a compromise. Uh, those databases that sites like that use are, are readily available. You can go out and download. You can find them, not, not even on the dark web, you can find them using this super secret hacking tool called Google. Ooh, and, <laughs> and so you can get them. And it's like this ready-made list of people to blackmail. And that's what's going on. So there have been a few different forms uh, for us that are in the IT Pro TV community, for you viewers out there, you're smart enough. You know these things are just a hoax or whatever. But think about your neighbors, your parents, some of the other employees at your company, people that are not technical. They see this, and they don't know if it's real or not, and it's embarrassing, so they don't want to go out for help. So it's a good idea to uh, just kind of give people a fair heads up and say, by the way, if you receive a communication like this, it's total BS, and don't send money anywhere, uh, and they don't have compromising footage. Doesn't mean you didn't go to an adult website. Maybe you did, right? <laughs> we, don't, we don't judge, but don't send Bitcoin to somebody over this one. It is just... Uh, it's just a, a really a phishing attack. Yeah, well, thanks for making me think about my parents um, calling me about this problem. <laughs> um, but so, so you're saying in this case where they were able to uh, to basically tie a phone number together, that's because they got some hacked database that they're able to uh, put a pass or put a, an email address with a phone number, and just they took those two things and yeah, put it together. Uh, you know, honestly, go to a convention and just mm -hmm. pick up business cards 
That's at each true. booth, yeah. right? And now you've got people with their work email and their work phone number. And you can just shoot them messages and say, I know who you are. Here's your name. name. Here's your phone number. Well, of course, it was on a business card that was out there in the public. But people, people panic and they think, oh, man, somebody's compromised my system. And they know this information about me. It becomes a lot more personal. It's a, it's a way to prey on people's insecurities. Yeah. You should really only be worried if they attach an image. Uh, it shows that they do, in fact, have your webcam. Uh, but I wouldn't open that image anyway. Um, and there so, are some well-known attacks yeah, there. Yeah, double, double, <laughs> double edged sword here. Do I check this picture? Uh, but webcam yeah. cover, that's, uh, that's the way to go. Got one there. Do you have? Oh, no, look at no, that. No, I don't have a webcam your cover. Your webcam is just out there for everyone. What do I have to hide? All right, well. <laughs> That's going to do it for us today uh, over here on, on TechNado. Uh, we, we had a great interview there and, uh, and some, some fun news stories to check out. I want to let you know about uh, something else cool coming up. We actually just did a webinar earlier today about A-plus and taking the CompTIA A-plus exam. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to see that, you can uh, actually still uh, get that information once we post the, uh, the video of the recording after the fact. But we have another webinar coming up here uh, very shortly about surviving a DDoS attack. It's something that uh, we've talked about here in the past and that's uh, it's been something that's been uh, a podcast um, story before and, and uh, talks about how we went through that process and, and identified it and were able to, uh, to remedy that. Uh, that takes place on Thursday, August 23rd at 2 o'clock Eastern Time in the U.S. Um, go ahead and sign up there at uh, go.itpro.tv slash DDoS, or you can just go over to itpro.tv slash webinars and see a full list of all the webinars that we have available past, present, and uh, and the future ones coming up there. So definitely check that out, um, Thursday, August 23rd. Even if you can't attend at that time, uh, by registering, you get the emails letting you know when uh, the recording is available, so you can check that out as well there. Uh, also, if you're interested in learning more about IT, uh, we've got all the great training over at IT Pro TV. Um, check it out there and use the uh, offer code PODCAST30. You get 30% off your membership for now and the future and all times. And it looks like uh, the Mother Nature is telling us that it is time to wrap up. I don't know if you can hear it, but, uh, but the thunderstorms are rolling in here in Florida. It's a typical Florida afternoon. So uh, I think that's our cue to go ahead and get off the air. What do you think? Yep, Peter and I have to go build an ark. Yep. And uh, once we're done with that, we will, I'm sure, sail around until next week when we're back with another episode of TechNado. So but definitely uh, check back in with us. We'll be around. Yeah, this desk seems about the same size as the Titanic door. And I think <laughs> we can both fit on this. So... Uh, I'll, I'll never let go, Don, but uh, we have there to we let go. go of you for this time. So we'll see you next week right here on TechNado. Are you enjoying TechNado? Then be sure to check out our other podcast, Ask Me Anything, where our subject matter experts answer your questions. Here's the latest episode, and here's the full playlist. And as always, be sure to subscribe to IT Pro TV's channel. IT Pro TV.